All right, can you guys all see the, the wiring diagram that I have on the uh, screen? Ross, just give me a finger if you see it, like up or down. No, you don't see it? Does anybody else see it? It says I'm presenting. Are you no, seeing it now? It. Yes, I can see it. Okay, good. Um, so this was a package created by Whirlpool to practice schematics and, and diagrams, but I also want to continue with, like, we talked about the voltage, ohms, watts, and amps, and like how do you use them when you're troubleshooting and, and what what's better than the other and one thing uh, I always stick to is voltage testing is going to be the the best way to troubleshoot an electrical circuit until it becomes unsafe uh, for example portion of the microwave is really high voltage almost 4,000 volts uh, you don't want to be testing DC voltage there uh, or AC voltage um, if you're testing voltage around belts and moving motors uh, or moving components that you know you could get electrocuted I did have one person uh, I know who was using his phone as a flashlight but he had it on a recording yeah Ross knows what I'm talking about um, and he was in the bottom of a washing machine and the front load washing machine some of them have heating elements underneath and he he was looking for a water leak and as it was dripping water he reached his hand underneath the machine while it was running and touched up against the element wires and <laughs> electrocuted himself he didn't kill himself or nothing like that but uh, the video was sure funny <laughs> um, yeah, I teased him for years about that uh, he's one of my technicians for my company but again voltage testing we're going to talk a lot about the different types of testing, how we're going to troubleshoot and what to troubleshoot, but voltage testing is the most uh, fastest and easiest way to troubleshoot problems in a machine. So with the assignment I gave, uh, we're going to start off with a, an old Whirlpool washing machine diagram. Most of you are probably not even old enough to have seen this diagram. It's a Whirlpool belt drive washer, um, and then they went to that direct drive, and I think even the direct drive now is being phased out. But what you're supposed to do with this diagram is they said that certain switches they closed for you or they want you to close certain switches and then they want you to highlight or draw a line through the circuit that's energized. So we're going to go through those circuits that are energized and I'm going to stop and talk a little bit about some of them and the importance of why are we doing this and how does this work with troubleshooting. Whenever I go to a, a machine that's not working or has a problem uh, and I need to use the wiring diagram and, and my meter to test it. First thing I want to know is when certain switches are closed or certain things are closed on the machine, what should be running? How is current flowing through that diagram? It's, that's one of the most important things. And um, if you look here, and I'm going to go ahead and go to my drawing tool, power comes in this black wire. And Did you make it a little, little bigger? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Can you make it a little bigger? Uh, yeah, I could stretch that diagram out. I was trying to get the whole thing on the diagram, but I can stretch that for you. Let me use my mouse. So, what they said on this diagram here is they wanted you to close switch number one and then draw a wavy line through the uh, through the circuit that is energized. So if we start at the black line which is line one and white being the neutral we got to come in here electricity has to run through and then come back out the other side here. So when we come into the black line this is line one coming in it goes in and it goes here and then we have two paths we can go up and we can also go this way but we did not close this switch. This is on most mechanical timer washers where you pull the knob out uh, to start the washing machine and that's what that one switch is. All they're doing is telling you to close switch number one which is this one right here. So even though electricity goes up to the switch and stops it doesn't go through. But here on this circuit the electricity goes up, it goes through something called a ballast 
and then a fluorescent light and I don't know how many of you have ever seen a washing machine with a fluorescent lamp on it but back in the 70s the old belt driven washers had a long fluorescent tube right over the control panel of the washing machine so if someone's washing in the evening they could see it so basically the highlighted line is where electricity is traveling now we talked the other day with both classes at different times that the load here is what divides line one and neutral this is line one black and this is neutral the white wire here and that separates the line and the neutral so when you carry your wavy line or the line that you draw through the load which is our fluorescent lamp here once we get through the load here this side is neutral and this is line one now remember line one we consider like the pressure or or the power supply coming in and neutral is where it returns a lot of people when they come out this other side they tend to want to go back this way through some of these other loads wiring diagrams they don't do it once you go through this load this electricity wants to make the fastest and easiest way out the circuit now I do have a question this is a ballast all right that almost works like a half of a transformer and a fluorescent lamp. These two components, how are they wired? Are they wired in parallel or wired in series? Series. That's good, Gerald. They are wired in series. These are like the same as the fluorescent lamps you have in office buildings and your schools and everything else that you have them long tube bulbs there's a ballast up in there that controls the light. AC voltage goes backwards and forwards 120 times a second. You don't notice it, but your light or your TV monitor or other things cycle on and off 120 times a second. If that happened with the fluorescent light bulb, the fluorescent light bulb might flicker. So the purpose of the ballast here is just to balance out that voltage going through your fluorescent lamp so that we don't get that flickering within the circuit. But once we go through the bulb, we want to go right back out. We don't want to go down through any other loads. And that's the same thing like as if I was going through this agitate solenoid down here. If I go through this agitate solenoid, once it comes out the other side, it's just going to go up and out to neutral. It is not going to revert backwards and go through any other load. Once we go through the load, we go out the other side. So we have line one here and neutral. Think of it as water comes out the wall here. Once it hits neutral, it's not going to go back up against where water pressure is coming from. So it's going to try to go out the other end. So that was the answer to the first one. Just basically simple, completing the circuit for the fluorescent lamp. Now, if you guys have questions, just, you know, ask me. I'll stretch these diagrams out a little bit so you can see them a little better. Uh, this one here, they want you to close specific switches. And even though they tell you to close it, they did close them for you on the diagram. And that would be, and I'll use a different color marker here and a smaller point here. That, that would be uh, one... So this is number one here, right here. Five, five is here. Five controls the high speed, the wash motor. Seven, which is right here. Oh no, it's right here. Seven's here, which controls that shape. And the other diagram, seven was down below. Uh, number 10 and 11, which are here, and they control the hot solenoid. And number 16, which is a vertical switch in the timer. And we'll talk a little bit later about what that does. So these switches are closed within the circuit. Now we have to travel through the diagram to find out what is running. Just because switches are closed does not mean that the, all those components are running. So we'll start with line one. <laughs> Hey, yes, sir. That pressure switch right there was shut off, right? 
to the water level for the hot water solenoid? I'll, I'll go through the pressure switch in a minute. Give me one second. I'll, I'll answer that question. Okay. So power comes in. They assume that you're going to close the timer switch this time. And we again, we have two paths. We can go up here, but number 2 and 25 are open. And then we can carry that current down through what we call our water level switch. Almost all machines have a water level or a water pressure switch. A lot of the newer ones, it's not a switch. Um, it works off of a frequency. I'm not going to get into that right now. But when you first turn on a machine, what's the first thing it is? It's, it's empty. So this washer wants to fill with water. So this switch is in the empty position right now. Power comes in, goes through here, feeds the hot valve, and goes out. Now if you guys look at the diagram, am I done? Or is there anything else that we could do to this, this machine? Anybody have any suggestions? I know Ross would say something, but he walked away before I said it. Is this complete, or is there anything else we need to add to this? Yeah, you got to add those other switches on top, because while that pressure is still not making it, once it gets full, and it's going to make connection. Okay. Um, but there is something that is energized right now that is not drawn. The cold valve. The cold valve. How do I get to the cold valve? Oh, no. If you go through switch number 10 and come down, and we go through the temperature selector switch here, it does feed the cold valve. So we're not filling with just hot water, we're filling with cold water. When we turn both them on at the same time, we're actually getting warm water. Now a lot of people ask, well, we have 5, 7, and 16 closed. Well, isn't my drive motor, my agitate solenoid, and my timer working too because these switches are closed? And the answer is no, but why? Because of the pressure switch I mentioned earlier. Okay. So right now the water level switch is saying the machine's empty. So if you've got a washing machine here and we're and we got our little agitator here, it's starting to fill up with water. It's not that high yet. If you put clothes in here and you start moving this agitator backwards and forwards without water, you can damage tear your clothing. So we want to make sure that there's enough water in the tank to wash the clothes without damaging the clothes. So these switches in the timer, even though they are closed, these components are not running the drive motor and the agitate solenoid, which is what shifts the transmission to wash, they're waiting for power. And they're waiting for the water valves to fill up the machine with enough water till it's safe to start washing. Now we don't energize the timer either. So what that means is while water's coming into this machine, the timer's not going to move. And this is on all washing machines because I don't know about some of you guys in certain places, but I've serviced some places that are more farm-like and people live off of well water. Hold on one second. And people have well water, so even though we're turning the hot and the cold valve on, I've seen it where it's taken about 30 minutes to fill a washing machine up with the proper amount of water. So if the timer itself was getting energized why water was coming into the machine, then the timer could actually advance or shut off before the machine ever filled up and it would never wash. So the timer, the agitate solenoid, and the drive motor are not energized because they're waiting for the water level switch to say, hey, we have enough water in there, it's safe to wash the clothes, go ahead and turn the machine on to agitate, and that's when the timer itself starts advancing. So these switches are all closed, but they are not energized or do not have electrical current flowing through them because the machine is empty. So the water level switch does that. Does anybody know what type of switch this is if we draw it like this? When you see a switch with three positions, what do they call that switch? A 
A what? That's called single pole. Single pole, double throw. Double throw. So there's one pole that the switch swings on, and it can swing to two different what we call throws, which is the outlet of that switch. It's the same thing like your gate around your house, that one part of the gate swings on the pole, and where the gate latches is what we call the throw. A single switch like this, with just two wires on it, is called an SPST, which is single pole, single throw. But one that has two positions is single pole, double throw. The only difference on here that I didn't draw is we had a little line like this, and that line means it's pressure activated. As pressure is increased here, it pushes the switch to the upward position. So right now, the only thing working is the hot and the cold valve. And even though these switches are closed here, these components are not energized. Let's go to the next diagram. I'll go ahead and zoom in on this one here too. Give me a second. Uh, excuse me, what page is that? Uh Oh, never see it. This one's page 11, and the other one was page 9. So these are all the odd numbers, and if you guys have the assignment printed, the even numbers, like 11 is the assignment, number 12 is the answer to number 11, basically how I'm doing it. But I'm not showing you the answer, I'm showing you how I wanted you to do this assignment. So in this case, they didn't tell you close these switches they've already closed them for you like if you could see this one's open but this one's closed so I'm gonna go ahead now and, and just go ahead and close the switches that the push-pull switch is closed number one is closed number 16 is closed number seven number five number ten and number eleven are closed these are the same switches that were closed in the last diagram but the difference is the water level switch now has moved from the empty position to the full position. So the water level switch provides many functions. One, it provides power to the hot and the cold water valves as well as a spin solenoid on this washer. It also provides power to the motor, the agitate solenoid, and the timer motor when the machine is full of water. But the third thing is, is it shuts the power off to the water valves when the machine has enough water in it so we don't flood the floor. So this switch here has like multiple functions inside of a washing machine. So let's go ahead and complete the circuit now. Power comes in. It goes down. I could go up here but two's not closed. I hit the water level switch but at this time the switch goes up. 6 is open, but 5 is closed, so I'm going to go through 5 and out. I'm also going to go up here through 16 and 7, and the agitate solenoid, and the timer motor. So what is the washing machine doing right now? Anybody? So it's on high agitator. Agitator. The motor's running on high, it's agitating. We would also call that wash. Now, first of all, most machines fill and drain two separate times. If they fill and drain for wash, what is the other cycle called that it fills up for? Rinse. Rinse, that's correct. So we have to fill up a second time for a cycle we call rinse. So the first time we wash and the second time we rinse, the wash and the rinse cycle is pretty much the same exact thing. The machine does exactly the same thing as you see it doing right now. The only difference is rinse has no soap. So the wash, we, we have soap that's entered into the machine. We drain that soapy water out. We spin the washing machine trying to extract as much of that soapy water out of the clothes. 
Then we'll fill it up a second time and try to get the soap out of the clothes. And then we'll spin it out trying to get as much of that water out so that we can throw the machine into the dryer or, or the clothes into the dryer. So this is for the wash cycle, but it is also the same thing as the rinse cycle. Now we have a high and low in the motor depending on the type of clothing. We can wash on high or we can wash on low. And the same thing during the spin. We can high spin or, or low speed spin. But in this case, these are the only three things that are working. Even though the timer switch is closed, the water valves are not energized because this water level switch is not sending power to them. So let's let's stop for a second now. Let's talk about troubleshooting and, and what that means. Going back to the circuit here with the hot and the cold valve, if the hot valve is working but the cold is not, Hot valve is okay, but the cold valve is not working. What most likely are the problems with my washing machine? What component or components failed? I'm not going to get into broken wires. It's just too many things to discuss. But what two things would you check on this washer by looking at this circuit? Hot water is coming in. No cold water is coming in. Now, it could be that the water's turned off. I'm more along the lines about electrical troubleshooting. I would check the solenoid and the controls it. Which solenoid? It's cold water solenoid. It's pretty easy to access. It's right underneath the cabinet, right behind where it hooks up. Okay, I checked the cold water solenoid, but what's the other component that could stop the cold water from working? The pressure fill switch? No, because I said the hot's working. So this this is what you do when you're tracing the circuits, and this is how circuits are... I'm sorry, Jay? Say that again? Select the switch. The temperature selector switch, that is correct, this one right here. So let me tell you how I look at this and how I troubleshoot diagrams. I said the other day, you know, you guys get those plastic sheets and lay on top of our diagram, but let me do something here. Let me erase it and then just go over it again. So I walk up to this washing machine and I put it to warm fill. By putting it to warm fill, I'm supposed to energize both the hot and the cold water valve. And I stick my hand down there and only hot water is coming in. I switch it to cold, no cold water comes in. So the first thing I do is I say, okay, the hot valve is working. So how is electricity flowing through this diagram to make this hot valve work? So if I do that, I'm going to trace this circuit here and send power down because I want to know how's power going through to the hot water valve. So if I can do this circuit on the diagram for the hot water valve, everything that I highlighted right now has to be good and has to be working. So then I would say, oh, what's my cold water valve? Well, I'm not going to draw all of it, but if, if I use just a, a smaller line, I go this way, and this way, and I'm just following it because I don't want to draw over top of it. And this is the same circuit for the cold water valve, except for at this point, this circuit takes a different path. And this is how the cold water valve gets its power. And then I'm going to draw along the outside. So now you can see where the blue and the yellow basically overlap here. So what I normally do is, it, mentally, I look at these circuits and then I erase them because if I got a line drawn over it, I know that that is working. So I'm going to remove all the yellow here, like this. And then the only thing left that I need to check would be what's highlighted in blue. And I only have two components on that machine I need to check. I need to check the cold water valve and this switch right here. So let me erase this for a second. How would I check the cold water valve? Give me a test you would make to check this cold water valve. So 
The solenoid? Okay, but I mean, the solenoid, what, what type of test? I'm asking, you said the valve, so I didn't know if that's what you meant or not. I was doing something else. Um, as far as checking with solenoid test for voltage, uh -oh. the is on. yeah, Jay, I would do a voltage test to see if I'm getting voltage here, because if I have 120, I know the whole circuit going to it is good. And then I just change the water valve. If I don't have 120, the only thing left is probably this switch right here. So if you see this dotted line here, this dotted line means these three switches are all inside that same box. Let me just go on the internet for a second and look up a Whirlpool water level switch so I can just show you a little bit about what they look like. So, oh, I, you know, I said water level, and I meant to say temperature selector switch. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting old, guys. So, water temperature selector switch. So, this is a temperature selector switch right here. I, I want to see, if, let me see if I get a good image, because I want to see the back side of that switch. Uh, so I can point some things out to you. Let me see if I can find an old school one that's got terminals on it. And my luck, I'm going to find all the newer designed ones and not the older ones. This is one right here. And if I can see the back side of that switch, that's what I want to show you guys. They don't show it. Um... I wish they showed you the other side of the switch. I got an idea. Repair Kinnick is pretty good at showing you pictures of parts. So if you want to see what a part looks like, like inside of a machine or something, um, you could go here and you could find this. And a lot of times they'll have multiple pictures. So you could see different angles of that switch. So let's. This is what I wanted to show you right here, and I'm going to zoom in on it a little bit. You know what? Let's copy that image. Oh, it's not going to allow me. But if you see here, we got a couple of terminals on the bottom. There's two of them right here on the left and the right, and it's got three terminals on the top. This isn't exactly the one in our diagram. But these are the terminals, and this is what that water temperature switch looks like. So let's go back to the diagram. In this case, we got one, two, three, four wires going inside of that switch. But we have three switches. Okay, if I wanted to check this one switch out, I'm going to check what they call G-BK and Y dash R. So what that means is G, oops, G B K means it's a gray or green, it's probably green, dark green, with a black tracer. And I'm just gonna put black. So the solid color of the wire is gonna be green. And I'll just color it in here for a second. So the solid color wire is going to be one color, that's brown, but you got the idea. And then it's going to have a black line or dash on the wire like that. So when you see two colors written for a color of a wire, the first color is what the solid color is, and the second color is either a dash or a stripe. And then the second one is yellow with red. So you find those two wires connected to that switch and you put your meter on it. Now I would do an ohms test. I would check that particular switch out and that's how I would test it but based on this circuit these are the only two things you would test now let's use one more hypothetical and then I got one more thing I want to talk about that switch for let's just say this time no cold or hot water come in okay so we said that the path for the cold and the hot was like this it came down 
went through the water level switch, went here for the hot valve, and went here for the cold valve. If both valves don't work, yes, you could have a bad valve, but what's the odds that both water valves are going to be bad at the same time? Not likely. So remember, when we're troubleshooting, if some components work in the machine and some don't, what we want to do is we want to try to find things that they have in common. So hot and cold valve are two separate valves and this temperature selector switch and this temperature selector switch only control one valve each and this timer switch number 11 only controls the hot, doesn't control the cold. So I'm going to erase them because 11 has nothing to do with cold. This temperature selector switch only does the hot and this temperature selector switch only does the cold by me erasing those components I don't have to test any of them so I'm gonna eliminate wires because yeah a wire can be bad but they don't break that often but what I need to do is find switches or controls that both the hot and the cold use because if one of them are bad it may shut both of them off because if you look, switch number 10 right here feeds power to the hot and the cold. So that switch is inside of the timer and we'd have to test that. The water level switch from violet to pink here. We'd have to check that. Timer switch number 1. And the push and pull switch. So when we're troubleshooting, we trace the circuits out. And we can eliminate things that they don't have in common to narrow down what we would test if we were troubleshooting. In this case, number 11, water level switch, timer switch number one, and push and pull. And if V to P gave me a good ohms reading, I'm gonna check it for ohms because I'm just checking that one component. Number 10, number one, and this are all in the timer switch. So all I'd have to do is make one test and if that part tests good, the only thing left is a switch in the timer because those three things are three different switches. Guess what? Change the timer. You're done. So you don't have to test one thing if you could trace these circuits out and see how these circuits work. So I want to go over one more thing in the water temperature selector switch here. Let me just expand it a little bit. Because the way they do it, it's a little bit hard to understand what's going on there. So I don't know if it's going to get too blurry, but I think you guys can see it. So here we got the temperature selector switch. And how do we know when these switches are all closed inside of the diagram? These little letters here are the key to this switch on the bottom. These letters here are for the switch in the middle and these letters here are for the switch on the top. So the switch on the top is HC and WC. What do you think that that is all about? While I'm doing that I'm going to look something up here. need this one here is that like high water control or something um, no actually it's pretty simple if I can just get a picture of a washing machine console that I can show you and this is one right here if I get a nice close-up view of that image I'd be so happy Granger sells a washing machine control panel. Let's see if I can see this image here close up. Uh, no, that's terrible, terrible image. Wow. Um, this one might be able. If not, then I'll just skip it. Yeah, they're, they're, these pictures are not that good. I should. I didn't think I was going to go over this now, but okay. So if the first switch has a HCWC on it, HC means hot, cold. 
If that's the case, what do you think WC is? Warm. Warm cold. and cold. So the reason why we have two of them, HC or WC, is that the customer mm -hmm. has this customer has selections that they can choose for their washing machine. The first letter is the wash cycle. Oops, that's a funky looking W. The second letter is the rinse cycle. So if the customer chooses HC, the wash is going to be hot and the rinse is going to be cold. And most washing machines use a cold rinse. Sometimes they'll have a warm rinse. But if you use a hot rinse when it's done, the clothes can be excessively wrinkled, even if they hang them on the line and put them on the dryer. So we never use a hot rinse. So we have an HW would be hot wash, warm rinse, or warm wash, warm rinse. CC is cold wash, cold rinse. WC, warm wash, cold rinse. And down here is WW. So you're like, but wait a minute, I see WC here, I see WC here. So if the customer wants to choose warm wash cold rinse, this switch would be closed. Let me just use a different color here. So if they use WC here, this one and this one would close. These switches do not open and close like a timer. This is only activated when the customer turns the knob on the front of the washing machine. Now we're not talking about computer control, we're talking about a mechanical switch. So if the customer chose warm warm, warm wash cold rinse, then we don't have a WW here so this one wouldn't be closed but we do have a WW here so this would be closed and we do have a WW here so in warm warm these two switches would be closed. When we go to cold, cold, oops, this one's not closed, this one's not closed, only this one is closed, and so on and so forth. Hot, warm, only this one is closed, that one's not, that one's not, or hot, cold, only this one is closed, and these others are not. So that's what those letters mean. The first letter determines what switch is closed for the hot, I'm sorry, for, for the wash, and the second one determines what is closed for the rinse. So you have to look at these switches to determine uh, what cycle are we checking. If the customer says, well, the cold water is not working, but the hot's working, what cycle would you test? What would you put the machine in if you're going to test the hot's working, but the cold's not? Which one of these settings would you choose? HC, WC? Wash. No, but the two letters. HC wash. HC. Well, I would actually go with WW. Why? Because they say the hot works, but the cold don't. But I'm going to tell you right now, don't always take what the customer tells you and just go by their word. Customers know less than you. If they knew what you knew, they wouldn't have called you in the first place. Prove that the hot is working and prove that the cold is not working. Maybe both aren't working, or maybe the, the, the cold is working and the hot's not, and they have the hoses reversed. Who knows what they did? But don't always go by what the customer says, okay? So let's move on a little bit. Okay, we got another diagram here. Now they're telling you 1, 2, 5, 14, and 16. Uh, they did close them for you again, so I'm not going to show that part of the diagram. Let me expand it out a little more. Uh, so if we look here, one's closed. Oops, wrong button. Push and pull's closed. One is closed. Number two is closed. Number 16 is closed. Number five is closed. Number 14 is closed. These switches are closed as well. And the water level switch is in the empty position. So let's go ahead and energize what is running right now. So if we follow this current line here, we come down, go through these switches, 
we go back up and we're going to feed the timer motor we're also going to go down and number seven is not closed number five is closed so we're feeding the motor so right now the timer and the motor are running this is not closed and I can't go this way this switch is open but I can go down through my water level switch go down here number 10 is open number 13 is open go switch number 14 through the lid switch through the solenoid here and out so what is the machine doing right now it's right here the machine is spinning the drive motors on the spin solenoid the solenoid spin and agitate they're both located on the transmission and they engage like a shifter just like you do in your car you shift it into gear and then you got a timer motor here which is also energized so these three components are energized right now and the machine is spinning and the only way we could do that is the machine's got to be empty to energize the spin solenoid because we don't want to spin a full tub of water have you ever like stirred chocolate milk or a coffee that had too much liquid inside of it if you stir it too fast what happens water will overflow it will spill. yeah the water will overflow so the empty switch makes sure that the water level it's not a hundred percent empty but it is a lot lower than the full position before the machine will be allowed to spin now this is for top loaders and this is a lot of the older ones now because the newer ones now don't fill up to the very top like they used to now we also have to energize the drive motor remember at the beginning he said hey if the machine's not in a full position the drive motor's not going to run so we had to have another way to send power to our drive motor as well as the timer motor so the timer can keep moving and keep track of the cycle and that is through this switch number two here does anybody know what switch number two is called it has a name and it's not just in Whirlpool Maytag uh, GE and all the other manufacturers that use a mechanical timer they all seem to have a switch that not the same number but has the same name I, I didn't understand a word you said <laughs> is, it, is it a wax switch bypass that's called a bypass switch now I didn't show the very first pages of this book that had the timer chart on it but if you guys looked at the book I sent you I think it was a second or third page you're gonna see a box with all these dashed lines on here I didn't want to get too deep into that today but if you look at switch number two you're going to see the word bypass and the reason why they call it bypass is because that switch bypasses the water level switch to feed power to these components in the other half of, upper half of this diagram so let's take a look at, at a troubleshooting scenario for this let me erase this for a second what if this washing machine washed but the motor did not run during spin well if it washed power had to come in here the machine had to be full for this motor to run during the wash cycle but we said that the water the motor is not running in the spin cycle well the only difference between the current flow during the wash as it is the spin is this path right here this motor gets path through here and there's really only one component that could cause this problem what do you think that component is where the motor will wash but will not spin the bypass switch now some people say well what about number 16 here because I'm not going through 16 for wash but I am going through here 
But in order for the machine to advance to the spin cycle, the timer motor has to get power. And the timer motor during the wash cycle was getting its power this way. So 16 had to be good. So the only switch that was really different is this switch number two in the timer. If I ran across this problem in a customer's home back in the day when I ran across this machine and I saw the motor was washing, I saw it was draining, I saw the timers advancing, I saw the hot and the cold was working, I'd just change the timer. I wouldn't even test the component. But remember, you have to know how current is flowing through this circuit for wash and the circuit for spin. The difference is this timer switch number two. That is the problem in the circuit. So far I talked about a lot of things. Do any of you guys have any questions about some of this before I go too far into the next diagram? No? I mean so far I'm just trying to... Uh, ju no, I'm just, just trying to understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, well, what we're trying to do is if they close these switches, we want to know how power is going through the diagram. This is the same thing you did with that single light bulb circuit and the heating element that had the two switches. Is you drew you drew a line like where line one was and neutral was, and we checked to see where voltage was. Well, this line is showing me how electricity is flowing through this diagram and what parts the electricity is flowing through. This drive motor is the motor in the washing machine. The timer motor is, if we look at, um, let's look at some pictures here. Whirlpool belt drive washer motor, which is this machine, is, you know, they don't even show this motor. <laughs> This is so old. This is the type of the machine. Uh, it's pretty neat that this, this is, remember I told you about the spin and the agitate, agitate solenoid? If we take a look at this image here, that is the spin and the agitate solenoid right there. The agitation one is on the right and the spin one's on the left. This is the drive motor here and it's driving a big old transmission. This is the pump. It's belt driven and this is a spin tube and brake assembly so it spins as well as uh, has a brake mechanism right here at the very top similar to like a car brake mechanism these machines are old I think they stopped making them in the late 80s so you young guys be glad you didn't uh, uh, work on these uh, I've had people that come up to me and ask me how do they change the belt it took them all day to change the belt and they couldn't figure out how to do it and I showed them how to change the belt in less than 10 minutes. That belt is part number 95405. I worked for Sears in the 80s and I still remember the part number. <laughs> so anyways, that was the drive motor and the spin and the agitate solenoid and this components here is that machine that we were just talking about. So we go back to the diagram here. That's the drive motor the agitate solenoid and the spin solenoid you're looking at here. Now the one confusing thing about diagrams is diagrams are broken down in easy to follow circuits like straight paths. And you have to be able to look at that path and say how does power get to a specific component. And when we're working on machines when you take this diagram and you walk up to the machine, you're like, wait a minute. I don't see the motor at the top of the washing machine and the agitate solenoid at the very top. The, the drive motor and the agitate solenoid are all the way in the bottom underneath the machine. So if we had a, a washing machine like this, that transmission would be down here. The drive motor would be right here, and that spin and agitate solenoid would be here, and this is the basket for the close. Okay? The diagram shows the agitate solenoid drive motor way at the top. Diagrams are not drawn to show you physically where they are in the machine. There are some diagrams, we call them pictorial, 
which use pictures. So instead of showing a motor as a line with a circle, they may actually show you a component like this as the motor. And instead of showing you a light bulb like this, which is a schematic drawing for a light bulb, they're going to show you a light bulb like this on the wiring diagram. And then a lot of people say, well, how come they don't draw the diagrams with a light bulb like this? Why are they using this? Well, schematics use symbols instead of actual photos. Because if I asked, without showing you my drawings right here, and asked everybody in the room right now, draw me a light bulb for a wiring diagram. Even if you guys were drawing the same symbol or the same bulb that I have here on the right, none of your diagrams would look the same. And if you drew it, you might be able to figure it out. But if someone else later came back around and tried to figure out how, what that part is or what that part looks like. If, if you looked at this, I told you it was a motor, but if you looked at it, it looks like maybe the side of a barn or a house. So, you know, you don't know what that is right there. But they have standardized symbols for these electrical components. And after the lecture tonight, I'm going to email you another package that came out before this one that starts to show you the color wires, what TM means, Y for yellow, BU for blue, OR for orange, and it also gives you the symbols. So you learn what a water level switch is, what a solenoid is, and a lid switch. If you looked at this, at this washing machine, we have two motors in this washer. We have one, two, three, four, five solenoids. There's only two different types of parts inside this machine. We have two motors and all these other things are solenoids. Solenoids look a little bit like this. They have a circle in the middle. And they have two prongs for wires here. And the only thing is, is when you give that piece power, it becomes a magnet and pulls up on a little metal plunger inside of here or shifts something, whether it's a water valve or a mechanical shifter in a transmission. That's what a solenoid is. But if you look at the schematic, they call it a hot valve or a suds valve. It's still a solenoid. The symbol tells me that's a solenoid. My drawing's not perfect, guys, but that's what that is. So when you're looking at a diagram, you need to be able to identify not just the way current flows through, but look at the symbols and identify what those components are with those symbols. So I'm going to stop tonight. We've gone an hour. I'm going to stop tonight and I'll do in the next lecture tomorrow night. And those of you guys that are here tonight as guests, if you want, I'll invite you for tomorrow. This is a Whirlpool dryer circuit and it has a lot more complicated things going on here is why does power go this way and not that way. And we'll go over that in tomorrow's lecture. Does anybody have any questions about the washing machine and some of the things that I've talked about in the washer? No? I got a question here. Sure. When you talk about finding the common, uh, the common component between two items. Yes. Uh, to load of interest. When you test for it, do you go closest to that load of interest um, to eliminate um, testing the different item, items? Or do you, how do you pick which uh, common item you're going to test out first? Okay, well, let, let's, let's just use another example. Let's say the machine filled up with water, right? But once it's full, it's supposed to wash. So we're going to energize the water, the, the drive motor the agitate solenoid and the timer. The motor's not running. Now I don't know if the timer's running you have to sit there and stare at it for a minute to hear it click. And the agitate solenoid you might hear it click as the magnet comes on but let's say all three of these are not working. Okay so then we say well how does power get through all three of these? So I'm going to draw a diagram and say this is how power gets to the motor. This is how power gets to the agitate solenoid and this is how the power gets to the timer right so now the question is 
Okay, so what most likely failed if these three parts are not working? It is possible all three parts are bad. Could have been an old machine and one part failed a long time ago and now the next one failed, but it's highly unlikely. So well, I'm going to eliminate that those parts being the possible problem because it's very rare that the motor, the solenoid, and the timer are all going to go bad at the same time. Now if I look, I can see the timer has its own path, so does this agitate solenoid. If you see agitate solenoid here, goes through switch number seven, but the drive motor and the timer both don't use switch number seven, so I'm not gonna check it, because if seven was bad, the motor could still operate. The timer could still operate, so I'm not gonna check this. Now, if five was bad, my agitate solenoid would still work and my timer would still work, so I'm not gonna check five. And number 16, if it was bad, I would still have a path below it for my drive motor. The motor would run, but it wouldn't agitate. You just hear the motor running. So all these components have to be good, or at least not my problem, because if 16 was bad, it doesn't stop the motor from running. So again, remember, we're drawing a line to see how power flows through, and then we say there's no way switch number seven has anything to do with this motor. I don't have to check it. So before I'm actually putting my meter on the machine and starting to test switches and components, I'm trying to eliminate things just by looking at them and, and just assume these three lines as pass through the woods. You know, one goes to the playground, one goes to the, to the lake, and the other one goes to, a, to a, a, a pavilion where you have barbecues. And, you know, you're not going to take this path to get to the pavilion if it's up here. So we're eliminating them. Now we also have to look and say, you know what? Water came in, so this is not bad because this is how power gets in from my water. So I eliminate the push-pull switch, I eliminate switch one, and now we come down to really only one thing that would stop these three. And then here's the question. But it has to be good from V to P because why? My water valves worked. But when the machine fills up, it goes V to T. So V to T may not close. It is possible that part of the switch functions, which is V to P, violet to pink that may be okay but violet to tan may not be closing that's a, a v by the way it looks like an n but v to t is not closing so based on that problem if water comes in and these components don't work i've just basically said well seven can't be it 16 can't be it five can't be it because five doesn't do anything here so i'm just looking at the path and by saying how does electricity flow through? I can eliminate some things to see what is my problem before I ever take the machine apart and start testing. The first thing a technician does is they walk into a customer's home. They ask customers questions. Ma'am, sir, what seemed to be happening uh, before I came out? Oh, it's doing this, it's doing that. Can you show me what cycle it's doing this and doing that? And they'll put it in that cycle for you. Watch what they do because sometimes it could be a customer error. Now you're watching the machine and you're listening for components that are working. You should be able to hear the drive motor run. You should be able to hear water coming in. You know, you listen to what's working and say, oh, I hear the motor running so that this circuit must be good. Oh, I don't hear the motor running. Water came in. And once it got to the right level, this switch went this way, water stopped coming in. So now my power's got to go this way. I don't hear the motor. I don't hear the solenoid. I don't hear the timer running. Well, what do all three of them have in common? Just that one switch. Yeah, they have this in common and this in common, but we've ruled those out because we said the water valves are working and they need that switch too. So again, by doing these tracing of circuits, it's not just to have you trace a circuit, but it's to get you to look at diagrams and see how components are controlled. And if there's common controls for these three components and all three are not working, that's the first thing I'm going to go test. Okay? Did that sort of explain what you're Thank asking? You. Okay. Uh, and again, this... 
I look at diagrams and I don't even draw these lines. I can look at that diagram and I can see all the circuits that are energized and I can see what components control what and I could have told you V to T without drawing any lines. But when I first started I had to draw these circuits. That's the only way you're going to see them and then eventually you'll just look at them and, and you'll just see those lines like like you, if I gave you a map and said hey take me to the beach you got to look at the freeway. Now, this freeway goes right to the beach. I'm going to take that freeway. But if you never looked at the map before, you're going to be a little confused. Okay, where's the beach? <laughs> you know, I don't know where it is on the map. So these assignments that I'm giving you is to practice with schematics before I get into troubleshooting with the voltages and the ohms and, and what they all mean. Because I'd like to get into more technical diagrams that have computers and thermistors and other things. But if you can't trace these circuits and see them without drawing the lines, you have to start by drawing the lines and then erasing parts that you don't test by saying, well, I don't check the hot and the cold valve and I'm not going to check V to P because I saw the hot and cold valve work. I know this is good. I know this is good. I know V to P is good. I know one's good. I know this is good because this part's working. So it's the practice with the diagrams. So what I'm going to send you, now some of you guys didn't have a chance to do those diagrams in this assignment. Please attempt to do the other ones because tomorrow night I'm going to go over the dryer diagrams and we're going to do the same thing but we're going to talk about those circuits. And there's some tricky circuits going on in there. There's uh, this power resistor and why is it there? Why does power go this way or go that way? Here we have this resistor here. What does this do? Um, why do we have this line here and this buzzer and this other line? Why do we have all these multiple paths and how do they work? This is all something we're going to discuss tomorrow night. But not only do you have this to do and try to catch up with the assignment, but I also want to send you the book that came out just before this. I don't have it open right now. But the book is nothing more than just showing you... Uh, a symbol like this and saying this is a symbol for a light bulb now draw a symbol for a light bulb uh, this is a symbol for a resistor or heater and it's going to tell you what the symbols are and the very first part of the page is going to tell you what all these letters on the diagram mean they're also going to tell you what a timer switch looks like if you look you see how heavy these switches are on the diagram these switches are all drawn heavy all those switches are inside of a timer this door switch is not drawn heavy. This relay, push to start relay is not drawn heavy. This centrifugal switch in the motor. Well, how do I know that's a centrifugal switch? Because that switch, and if I turn it this way, has an arrow like this and a curved arrow. I will explain tomorrow what that all means. Any other questions? No? Well Yeah for the um Yes. For the uh for the diagram, the practice song, is that in the pure? No, I emailed it to you today. I emailed okay. I have to go back in and uh double check. Yeah, I did email you the book. Uh I'll make sure I, I did email to you. If I don't see it in my outgoing box, I will send <laughs> both together but I'm going to send a second book that has electrical symbols which really you're supposed to do it before the diagrams but I wanted to just talk about a few things point a few things out and then I want you to go back and and learn those electrical symbols if you want to be good at troubleshooting circuits this is how it's going to start I will get more complicated and give you stuff to teach you circuits and diagrams both of these books have the answers in them. I don't mind if you attempt to do it and then you go back and look at the answers. On these diagram ones that we're talking about here, page 15 is the assignment. Page 16 is the answer to that diagram. Page 17 is the next dryer diagram. Guess what? Page 18 is the answer. On the one with the, with the symbols, they have a whole bunch of boxes on the page. Big boxes and then just a little paragraph and an answer.
That's all it is. Uh, so you have to go through each box and answer them. At the end of the book, they have all the answers for those assignments so you can check your answers. If you don't know what it is, go ahead and go to that, that answers, figure out what it is. And then what I want you to do is on a piece of paper, make a note. When you looked at something, you say, you know, I did this, I see the answer, but I don't understand why it's going that way so that I can go over it with you and explain it to you guys. All right? I'm going to end class for tonight, and I will send you all a link for tomorrow, including the guys I invited today, uh, and I will send you the book as soon as we hang up so you can practice both the symbols and complete these diagrams. Otherwise, I'm going to go eat dinner. Ross is all that eating, and he's got a big sign bigger than him behind him that says, Eat is making me very hungry. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on. Jay and Christian, you were both talking. Uh, Jay, go first. I was just saying thank you, and, and you guys have a good evening. Okay, you're welcome, sir. You have a good night. Christian, you were saying something? No, I was saying say thank, thank you. Okay, thank you all for Sorry, Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome, and thank you for being a part of my class. Have a great night. It's sir. Uh, my pleasure. <laughs> yes, Ross. Z. Yes. I just wanted to tell you, that sign is not bigger than me. It just looks bigger than me. Well, after you lost weight. <laughs> All right, y'all. Let me get this thing going. Good night.